Hey, good morning. Welcome to church. Those of you, you uh, joining us on the live stream or in the room, a few of us in the room, it's great to have you here. Um, as some of you may have noticed, we are in the middle of a pandemic and uh, we're just having to take a couple of precautions here. You'll see Mel, the amazing Mel, in her prophecy vest this morning, hoping to get a word just by chance, thought she'd wear a fluoro vest. And uh, it's great to um, have you guys all here. But if anything happens, any alarms, whatever, just follow Mel in the prophecy shirt. Um, our lose, uh, everyone here is, I think, pretty much, yeah, part of the fam. So obviously you guys know where the lose are. And if there's any fire incident, we'll meet out the grass across the road in front of the fence. Great. Other than that, let's praise. Why don't you jump to your feet and let's make the most of um, just magnifying our God this morning. Thanks. We're just putting the tripod up with the new camera. All you're getting is backs. So we're just trying to make this work as we go, realizing that most of our church is joining us uh, from home. And it's great to have you guys with us today. And we are just continuing to work on this. So as we move into the next couple of months, as we realize people are going to be uh, not able to make it uh, more and more, that um, we've got something that can get straight into your home. And um, you guys can just enjoy it from right where you are. Awesome. 
Uh, yeah, just on that note, we're obviously increasingly aware of a bunch of people who are not just uh, sleeping in and not coming to church, but actually unable to be here. Our phones as pastors have just been going um, every day, literally, with people coming down, with people we're finding out almost after the fact. But um, obviously, even uh, uh, Pastor Jamie and Becca not able to be here. It's in their family. It's in their home. They're coming at the other side of it and doing well uh, now, but um, sounds like it's not particularly pleasant. So... Um, just continue to lift them up in prayer, but just be really vigilant. Um, whether you're watching this at home or in the room, if there's some people that you haven't seen for a while, um, you, you, people you would normally do some life with, just reach out. I know there's a couple of people just come to mind this week, and I wish I'd sent them a text because I found out afterwards they were going through it and hadn't let us know. And uh, it was amazing just the people whose names just happened to come to me were the people that were affected. And so I really encourage you just to lean into that at this time. If there's people that just get on your heart, why don't you flick them a text, see how they're doing? Because uh, you might be a lifeline to them. And, of course, the immediate question is, what do you need? What groceries do you need? We, um, my incredible wife was uh, just decided to cook all yesterday afternoon on the spur of the moment just because we just wanted to get food and packs to people and just um, something to brighten up their day, some colouring books, some chocolate for those who've got little kids and just wrestling with this stuff. And just really encourage you, this is the basic form of Christianity. Come on, just loving our neighbour, just looking after each other. What makes us different to the soccer club down the road or the whatever, we're people that are genuinely invested in each other's welfare. So let's just go the extra mile to love our neighbour well over this season because, you know, that's how distinctive as a community is the way that we care for each other. So let's be diligent. This isn't a crisis for the church. This is an opportunity for the church to show who and what we really are. And so really um, encourage you guys to lean into that. And uh, as I said, there's a couple of people I've well, on my heart that I didn't text and I really regret it because uh, they ended up the people were actually doing it really tough at the time. So let's be vigilant. Let's be looking after each other. And let's be really clear about who we are as a community. And we know that who we worship um, is revealed by what comes out of our hands. And we want to be people that, that love well. So cool. What's the next one, Rebecca? Cool. Hey, so obviously just in these COVID times, we haven't got a giving station. We're just trying to keep um, contact to a minimum. But as always, ta-da, we have uh, incredible magic of online banking and giving. And uh, yeah, wow, I, I get excited too. Anyone else in the room? Um, come on. Uh, and look, over this time, I know there's plenty of disruption, but I can tell you the bills aren't disrupted. And there's still stuff going on. Really encourage you, if you've been in the practice of giving, really encourage you just to to um, continue on with that. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your partnership in that. If you've been part of our church for a while, maybe just even been online, haven't been in the building for a while, it's just really easy to kind of disconnect perhaps from some of the realities of church. But we really value your partnership, your faithful giving and your commitment to not just say you're in, not just to sing you're in, not just to turn up, but actually to be invested at a financial level makes such a difference for us here. Hey, look, and it's, the Bible tells us it's one of the big things that's going to compete for our heart in a world like we're in, where there's always just going to be the desire to put that second and put something else first and really encourage you guys to engage that discipline. If it's not a discipline that you've engaged up to this point, really encourage you. Something that we've always done as a family, something we're going through in this season, teaching our children um, because it's so important. This is how the church moves forward and continues to go from strength to strength is because of the partnership of the many. So thank you so much for your diligence in that space. Hey, but you've heard enough from me. Uh, we're going for a real treat a bit later on. Got Pastor Ray with us, and that's going to be awesome. We've got him for a couple of services this morning. He's worked very hard, done a, a two day intensive here for our college, as well as um, pre recorded something for our Tamuka family tonight, and is down with our Waimati crew tonight as well. So we're really grateful to have you, uh, Pastor Ray. It's going to be incredible. And right now, we are going to just um, jump back to our feet, and we're going to just engage in time of worship. Really encourage you whether you're here or you're at home and you're watching online just to really pre like lean into God because it, does, it doesn't matter how chaotic times get, God will still be like constant in our lives. And it doesn't matter whether there's heaps of us or there's a few of us or it's your family at home or it's you and one other person, we can still lean into God and worship Him. And, and it doesn't, God doesn't change, and so our worship doesn't have to change. So I just really encourage you. All the weight of His glory, all the wonder of His grace, the power of salvation. The from the grave, this hope is not empty. If forever He will reign, He put to shame. 
song because um, the song it says who else would die for our redemption who 
um, whose resurrection means I'll rise. There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. And I, I love it, and I love how beautiful this is and how it paints a picture of we're going to never be able to do enough to like repay God for everything he's done for us. But we can still worship him while we're here, and we can still worship him after we're here. And we have forever to worship him and thank him. And although it will never be enough, we can still try. And we can still worship him and praise him and give him all we have because he deserves it all and he deserves more than it all. And um, he's created us to be people that um, shine his light to everybody else. And so when we worship him, we can connect with him on a deeper level that helps us to do with it. And I love, I love worship because for me, even when I'm having a crappy day, even when things aren't going well, even when it's chaotic, even when it feels like I have nothing left to give, if I turn to God and I worship, I just, I just forget about it all. And I just remember how good he is and everything he's done for us and this thankfulness comes back into my heart where I'm not, oh my gosh, I have to do this. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do this. And instead of feeling stressed, I just, I feel relief and I just, I just feel grateful. And I think just today, I really encourage you to, we're going to sing this song and just as we, we sing it and we give everything we have, that we would just be thankful and we wouldn't be worried about what's going to happen after church, what happened yesterday, what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next week but we'd just be here in the moment and that we'd just be thankful for everything he's done even in the times when we couldn't see it if we look back we can see it so I just really encourage
Yes, Lord, we just give you the glory this morning. You are so worthy of it all. God, we lift you up in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of the uncertainty. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We fix our gaze afresh on you. The beginning and the end. It's you, Lord. I'm reminded of the psalmist's words, my formation practices or my spiritual disciplines, whatever you call them. In the morning, uh, I always try and touch, just jump into psalms just briefly to kind of kick me off before I jump into something in the Gospels and then uh, normally something in the New Testament epistles. But love it how the psalms, just that journey of so often chaos all around and starts with despair and it starts with kind of describing your circumstances to God. But by the end of the psalm, the psalmist is almost describing his God to his circumstances. There's an invitation, even as we magnify him in that song. He's, the, the psalmist says, come magnify the Lord with me. Come make him big with me. Come and choose to amplify him in the moment rather than the circumstances. And you know, as people who are anchored on the rock of the revelation and teachings of Christ. You know, we are disciples. We are those who are postured at His feet, who allow Him to fill our view. Just as Mary took that posture and Martha was so frantic because of the circumstances, but all all Mary could see was Jesus. And sometimes in the chaotic times and circumstances, we just need to posture ourselves in such a way as to allow Him to fill our view. That we have to look past Him to the circumstances, that He is the view that frames our circumstances. It has to go through the lens of who He is, who He's always been and who He always will be. And that's what makes us an anchored people. That's what makes us a peaceful people in in uncertain times. It's what makes us an anchored people in the midst of the storm. And so, God, we just simply declare we are just so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful that, Lord, we are not drifting with the tides and the currents, but we are anchored in you this morning. You are our hiding place. You are our rock and our firm foundation. And you are worthy of everything we have in the room, in our homes. When we stand up, when we sit down, when we come home, when we go out. Lord, it's, it's all about you. And we just want to live lives that honor you, that reflect that you are who you are to those around us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you, team, for leading us just so beautifully this morning. Just outstanding. Well, without further ado, it's my great uh, joy to formally introduce you to Pastor Ray Moxham, anyone who's been through our college, and there's been a bunch of people now um, across our campuses that have been blessed by um, Pastor Ray. He's the Old Testament or First Testament, he'll correct me, it's the one day I shouldn't use Old Testament when Pastor Ray's in the room. Um, but he is our First Testament lecture, lecturer at Alpha Cruces College, he's just been down doing a two-day intensive Um, with our students, but he is an incredible blessing across the nation um, and just helping with the formation of our leaders um, and training pastors and doing all that stuff, but leads a great church with his wife, Caroline, in Hamilton. And um, they're just a blessing to their church, but they are a blessing to the body and a blessing to certainly our movement. And um, I'm someone who has a bigger view um, in terms of what's happening around the nation, just deeply grateful for who you are and what you bring 
uh, Ray, I know I've been blessed. Was, uh, he was my First Testament lecturer by distance, and um, it's just a real privilege to have you with us, and we're just excited about what you're going to share with us today. Thank you so much. Can we give him a hand as he comes? Need to lose a mask. Yeah. Good, morning. Good morning. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Real joy to be here this morning. The lessons went really well. Two days of lecturing went really well. Uh, nobody died. Yeah. And any time that nobody dies, it's a good lesson. You know, we, we, look, we had to do CPR a couple of times, you know, but, but hey, no, no lasting ill effects. So I, th I, think it's, I think it's good. Greetings from Freedom Christian Church. And uh, before I go any further, Mike, Michelle, thank you for what you do in the movement. You know, thank you for the work, the hard work that you put in. Thank you for the enthusiasm that you bring and the passion that you bring. Thank you for the, just the energy that you bring into things like Fearless. You know, you, you don't always get thanked. And churches don't always understand. But I want to say a huge thank you. And uh, to Mike, if not Michelle, thank you for having less hair than me. <laughs> it's uh, you know really good that uh, somebody has less hair than me. You're doing pretty well, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I did have hair once. Psalm <laughs> 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him. For his surpassing greatness. Praise him for his acts of greatness. Praise him with a trumpet. Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel, not the tambourine. We got delivered from that. We don't let tambourines in our services anymore. Praise him with a timbrel and with dancing. Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with the strings and the pipes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This psalm is a call to worship. But it's more than that. It's always more than meets the eye in the psalms. There's always something going on beneath the surface. And the psalm kind of begins with... Um, and ends with a word that you will know. It says, praise the Lord in my English version. But that's the word, hallelujah. Have you heard that word? Good, just making sure I'm speaking to a group of Christians. You, know, you, you wouldn't want to make that mistake, would you? So praise the Lord. It starts with, hallelujah. Then it goes on to praise God. Hallelujah. And then it goes to praise him. Hallelujah. In Hebrew, who is he? And he is she. And it's really confusing. <laughs> we use hallelujah all the time. Uh, we use it as uh, you know, an expression of praise. But that's actually not what it is. Hallel is an imperative. Praise. Just like when I say to you, sit, sing, give, dance. The ooh bit on the end of hallelujah is collective. So it's not you praise, it's all of you praise. I am going to move around and give that camera nightmares. Really enjoying church at the moment. This really has given us an opportunity to do new things. And uh, that's good. And I'm enjoying I get to, to we, we, we're doing 25 too. And we're doing four services of 25 on a Sunday morning. And I'm enjoying speaking to a smaller group of people. I'm enjoying actually getting a chance to talk to people. We, we, can, we can use this. We can work with this. We can build something new. We can refocus on what church means. And it's really good. But that's getting really off the subject. <laughs> it's a command. Praise the Lord and we need to do that. We really need to praise the Lord. Now, in this psalm, four questions get answered. They don't get asked, 
but they get answered. Why should we praise, or where should we praise the Lord? Well, we should praise him in the sanctuary, that's here, that's where the temple is. We should praise him in his mighty heavens, that's eternity. We're going to praise him right the way through that. Uh, Why should we praise? Because of his mighty acts, because of the incredible things that he's done. And generally in the Psalms, that's going to mean creation. And that's going to be the way that he delivered us and the way that he brought us through trouble and the way that he brought us through difficulty. And then it says, how should we worship? And it gives a list of instruments. And then it says, who should worship? And it says, everything that has breath. Do you have breath today? You have breath today. You know, but you're not the only thing that's got breath. There's a whole bunch of creation that's got breath. And everything ends up praising the Lord. Now, Psalms, let's do some theory. You want some theory, don't you? That's why you invite Bible school lecturers to preach. (laughs) Always a dodgy move. Five books of Moses. The law. You might have noticed that Psalms is divided into five books too. Five books of David. And when we read the five books of Moses, we get a little bit sort of frazzled. You know, all these rules, all these commands, all these rituals, all these things that we're supposed to do. And it's all very dry and it's all very sort of formal and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and then you get into the Psalms and you discover that it's all very personal, all very practical and, and, and all about your relationship with God and all about free forgiveness and all about the wonder and the glory of God. And, and sometimes we make a disconnect between those two. But Psalms is actually telling you how the children of Israel did Moses, how they did their faith. And we recognize in these psalms our faith. And that's really quite exciting because they worship God the same way we do. And they knew him to be the same God that we know him to be. Technically, we say that psalms are from below. What does that mean? Well, Moses. Moses stands on the mountainside. And he speaks to the people and he says, thus saith the Lord. Who's speaking? Well, it's God. This is coming from above. God speaking to human beings. Jeremiah stands in the temple and he says, the word of the Lord came to me. This is God speaking. But the Psalms are different. The Psalms are us speaking to God. They're from below. They're human beings expressing their feelings to God. And when you look through the Psalms, you will discover that everything you will ever go through in life, one of the psalmists went through it, felt how you feel, found a way to worship God through it. Psalm 137 says, I feel bad. Life has fallen to pieces. Psalm 88 says, I feel really, really bad. Psalm 73 says, why has my unsaved neighbor got a better car than me? (laughs) Psalm 91 says, when I went through trouble, God was with me. And Psalm 23 says, God has met my needs. And every experience you ever go through, the tapestry of your life, It's read by the Psalms. I was, I don't know, 17, 18 years old. My parents had already left for Israel and I was living in a bedsit close to my work but a long way away from my church and a long way away from my friends. Yes, I had friends. And I wrote off my first car. Crashed it. Narrow country road. Straight into this car coming the other direction. Got home, sat in my bed sitter, sat on my bed, feeling as bad as I had ever felt in my life. Feeling really alone. Did a stupid thing. Picked up the Bible. Read Psalm 42. And suddenly discovered the psalmist knew what I was going through. The psalmist felt how I felt. And he found focus in God. And suddenly, it didn't seem so bad. 
And you know what? It's never felt so bad since. Because, like they found a way, I found a way. But I'm getting off track. Every human experience you're going to have is somewhere in the Psalms. Now, the order of the Psalms is kind of interesting because the first Psalm, in fact, the first two Psalms are introductory Psalms. Blessed is the person who does not sit, walk and stand, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord like a tree planted by the streams of water. And it's kind of like we're being told what to expect from the Psalms. If you want to learn how to live a life that pleases God and is blessed, this is the outcome of the Psalms. Right, and then we go through a whole bunch of psalms. First of all, we go through some really miserable psalms, some life sucks psalms. But as we move on, we start to move towards actually God's in control. And then we get at the end to a bunch of five psalms that are all about praising the Lord. And this last psalm uses that hallelujah 13 times. And it's been deliberately placed here at the end of the book because the only way that the book can end is with praise. Now here's the deal. The book ends with praise because that's how everything finishes. It always finishes in praise. Have you read Revelation? Um, you, know, you, you know you need to get special permission from the pastor to read Revelation? You, you know that's the way it works? You know, because we then have to monitor you for craziness? And there's this crowd in front of the throne. Every tribe and tongue and nation and people. And what are they doing? They're worshipping God. Salvation belongs to our God. And that's what happens. This whole world ends in praise. And that's how your life's going to end too. You're going to stand at the end of your life and you're going to look back and you're going to realize what God has done in your life. And you're going to see that he's worked all things together for good. And you're going to see the wisdom of God. Because at the time, it doesn't look like it. When you're stuck deep in Psalm 88, have you read Psalm 88? Right, if you go home today, read Psalm 88, but just make sure you have a, 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 a pack of antidepressants <laughs> sitting next to you. We're stuck in Psalm 88, and we don't see it, and we don't understand what God's doing. We don't see the big picture. I'll tell you what the big picture is. It ends in praise. And it ends in praise because God has stepped into your life with all of his awesomeness. And I'm going to put my glasses on because I can't read my notes. Don't get old. Because all the way through the book, we've experienced God in every single situation of our lives. And by the time we come to the end, it's sort of drawn us closer to God. And there's no other way that it can end but with praise. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to praise the Lord. We're going to praise the Lord because in the end, God is all there is. And he is the ultimate reality. And we've come closer to him. And that's why we're going to praise the Lord. Everything in your life is going to end in praise to get to that point you have to go through a whole heap of difficult psalms but that's okay because it's going to end in praise okay back to the psalms praise him in his sanctuary praise him in his mighty heavens so that's here and that's in the future that's here in church that's here in our lives and that's when we finally get in front of the throne. We're going to praise him for his acts of power. Uh, we're going to praise him for his greatness, the things that he's done for us, because God is great. And uh, we're going to praise him using instruments. And the first instrument we're going to use is a trumpet. Why didn't we have trumpets on stage? You left it behind. Who plays the trumpet? Okay, so can we just close that door? Because I'm just a little bit frightened now. You see, see, in Bible times, they were wise enough to realize that the trumpet was not a worship instrument. Wow. 
the trumpet was used for two different things. If you had a festival in the temple, you blew the trumpet to say this is the beginning of the festival. Or if the Day of Atonement or the, the, the year of release, the year of Jubilee, it was the trumpet that declared the year of Jubilee. Or if you were on the battlefield, it was the trumpet that gave you instructions what to do. And uh, it's kind of this idea that when, when the word of the Lord comes out and people respond to it, when God gives a command, when there's a call to worship, or when there's a call to, to battle or to action, and we respond, that's worshipping God. That's a form of worship. In our lives, back in our church in Jerusalem, we had a dude that played the trumpet. His name was David Bogenreef, and he was legendary. You can play the trumpet in church. I was joking. That's if the pastor lets you. But then you move on to harp and lyre. That doesn't mean you can lie. Right? Not that kind of liar. And these are professional instruments. These are what the Levites played. This is, you know, proper, serious music, slightly orchestral. But as the list goes on, it gets more sort of ordinary. So you get down to the, the, the timbrel, which is a, a hand drum and dance. And, and that's what the women did. And, and then you get down to uh, the cymbals, tzalt salim, it's kind of onomatopoeic. And uh, any idiot can play the cymbals. And it's sort of like we've moved from the professional instruments right the way through the scope, right until we've got down to the ordinary instruments that anyone can do. And it's kind of like worship being open to all and taking what you've got and using it to worship God. And it's all embracing. Now, I want to point out the obvious to you. This is a muso's list. Whoever wrote this psalm was a muso. Fair enough? Me, I'm not a muso. I used to play the saxophone. And when I picked up the saxophone to practice, the dog got up and walked to the door. It's true. Please let me out before you start. I do lighting. I'm a lighting tech. I've done it all my life. And... Uh, Somebody in my church recently, very foolishly, said to me, Pastor, you don't need lights to worship God. <laughs> I spoke really well at his funeral. <laughs> the, the, the building we've got is a great building, but it's got really low ceilings. It's low, lower ceilings than this. It's kind of like this, and that makes lighting really, really difficult. And I've got all these vintage lights lined up. Lights that they produced in the 1950s, because I'm kind of passionate about these lights. And every now and then you'll get a visiting speaker that will say, those lights are in my eyes, can you turn those lights off? No! I like those lights more than I like you. Let's be clear about this. Of course you don't need lights to worship God. You don't need a keyboard to worship God. You don't need a trumpet to worship God. You don't need AV gear to worship God. You don't even need a guitar. The issue is, when I'm putting up a lighting rig, you know what I'm doing? I'm worshipping God. That's what I'm doing. I'm worshipping God. That's my form of worship. When I sit behind a lighting desk, unless it's rock and roll or dance, I'm worshipping God. That's my expression of worship. So praise God with the Fresnel and the profile. Praise God with the follow spot and the moving head. You know, that's my list. And that's what I'm going to do. What's your list? How are you going to praise the Lord? And if this idea of praising the Lord is the ultimate outcome of your life, you can't just praise the Lord here. How are you going to praise the Lord at work? How are you going to live in such a way that people look at you and God's name gets glorified? Yeah. You know, you've got to learn how to worship God. Uh, my wife is uh, back home at the moment organising church. 
with exactly like you guys, half of our church off with COVID and all the people that we normally rely on not around and me down here. Um, one of the first commandments that God gives to men about their wives is to love them. God is love. Made in his image. The ability to love is part of that image. And you know what? When I love my wife, when I fulfill the command of God to love my wife, when I'm nice to her, and I am occasionally, <laughs> when I do good things for her, I'm worshipping God. Yeah. I'm worshipping the God that said, husbands love your wives. Collective pronoun, you're not allowed more than one. <laughs> you get the idea? And everything you do has got to be done with that edge of worship. And the danger is that instead of our lives bringing worship to God, people around look, say, those Christians, look how terrible they are, look what they do, and, and look at the way they work Look at the way they're always the laziest person in the job. And, and We're not supposed to bring blasphemy to God. Our lives are supposed to be the hallelujah. Yeah. They're supposed to be the things that bring glory to God. So make your life the hallelujah. Time for me to prophesy wildly and recklessly. I like the Psalms because they are all of human experience. And in a room like this, and with the people watching at home and the people that will be in the next service, there are all kinds of things going on in your lives. Some of you are having the best week ever. And some of you have just lost your job. And some of you have just caught COVID. Hopefully nobody here. <laughs> And uh, some of you are going through all kinds of health problems and problems with your kids and your car's just broken down. And there's just a whole array of different emotions that are going through a church like this on any given Sunday. And let me tell you something. Whatever the situation is right now, it's going to end in praise. Because that's the only way it can end. And you're going to look back... On today, you're going to look back on those dark days and you're going to realize that God saw you through. And you're going to realize that God was with you. And you're going to realize that he was working everything for your good. I told you about writing off my car. That was a formative moment in my life. Because on that day, I learned things that have stood me instead ever since. Why would I not praise the Lord for that day? It all ends in praise and you get to end up standing in front of that throne with all kinds of people around you that you never even dreamt were Christians and all kinds of people around you speaking all kinds of weird languages worshipping God because that is how your life ends and that is how the world ends and we give back to God the hallelujah. I've got seven minutes. I can do this. I can do this. One of the joys in my life is teaching Hebrew narrative. And Hebrew narrative is really interesting. The way stories work in the Bible is fascinating. And some, somebody said, a wise person once said, the most dangerous place you can be in the Bible is halfway through a story. Yeah, actually, that was me. Uh, ask Daniel. Ask Daniel what it's like to be halfway through a story. There, there, kitty cat. Yep, nice kitty cat. Uh, ask, ask Job what it's like to be halfway through a story. Right? Ask, uh, ask Paul, sitting in prison one of the many times, what it's like to be halfway through a story, clinging to a piece of wreckage, hoping to float to shore. Ask Abraham what it's like to be halfway through a story. When are these promises ever going to be fulfilled? Have I wasted my time all of these years? Ask Joseph what it's like to be halfway through a story. 
you have a dream and everybody tries to destroy that dream and you end up a slave in Egypt and just when things look to be going well you end up thrown into prison and nothing you've done by the way the Bible school the Bible scholars smell a rat here because in the ancient world you didn't get thrown into prison for adultery in the ancient world you got dead for adultery it was the second only to, to murder in the in the hierarchy of, of bad crimes and as a slave if you're accused of murder there is of adultery there is no way you end up in prison you know, your life is going to be short it's going to be maybe five minutes before you're dead because uh, you don't have any rights so when we know he ends up in prison, it kind of suggests to us that maybe his boss smells a rat. Maybe he knows what's going on here and actually wants to spare Joseph, but Joseph's sitting in prison. And all he knows is that at any moment, he could be taken out and killed. That's his future. And all these promises and everything's going on. And, and Sometimes when I tell this story in church, I stop there. I leave him in prison. Because I can do that, because I'm the storyteller, right? I just leave him there, in prison, with all these other prisoners and, and, and the grot and the, and the rubbish and the, the junk that he's going through. You see, we've read, we, we read the end of the story. We know the end of the story. We can't unread the end of the story. We know that in one moment, everything changes in his life. And this dude breaks in through the door and says, Joseph, Pharaoh wants you. And then says, Man, you stink. Can you take a bath? That was funny. Laugh. And um, everything changes in one moment. You know, for most of us, the only thing that's wrong in our lives is that we're halfway through a story. Halfway through the Psalms. Stuck in Psalm 88 with the antidepressants next to us. Your life doesn't end there. Your life ends in praise. You look back and you see what God has done. Halfway through a story is dangerous. Halfway through a story is full of doubts. Halfway through a story is full of unanswered questions and fears and temptations. It's a great place to lose hope. It's a great place to lose faith. It's a great place to get depressed, to lose the dream, to panic, to quit, to shrink back to backslide, to ask what's wrong. Well, the only thing that's wrong is that you're halfway through a story. So look to God. Take a look at Psalm 20, 150 and believe that's where God's taking you to. I have a theory. All the time Joseph is in prison, he's humming the tune to Psalm 150 under his breath. Because he knows where his life ends. Halfway through. Christianity is halfway through. And we've got all kinds of threats. All kinds of difficulties. A secular world that doesn't like us and doesn't want us and doesn't feel they need us. COVID. Will the church ever recover? The rise of Islam and all the other threats that we face. And you can look at all these threats and you can give in. But it ends in praise. This church is in the middle. You're in the middle. You're in the middle of a building project. You're in the middle of an unfinished building. It can be daunting. Will we ever get this building where it needs to be? It's going to end in praise. It's going to end in the hallelujah. So where are you right now? What's going on in your life? If times are good... Learn how to praise God. And if times are bad, and lifting your head above the precipice, lifting your head out of the sheets on a morning is difficult, you need to know that it does not end here. The faithful God has hold of your hand. And he is going to lead you into praise. And lead you into worship. Can we stand together? Are we going to sing something? Are we going to... Thank you, Lord. 
Lord across the room and across all those people doing the live feed and sitting at home and hopefully having got out of their pyjamas by now. Lord, we want to make that faith statement, our life ends in praise. And whatever we're going through right now, whatever difficulty we're facing, we're going to do exactly what Mike said the psalmist did, does. And we're going to take our grief and we're going to be honest about it and we're going to look it in the eye and recognize what's going on in our lives. We're not, not going to awfulize it. We're not going to make it worse than it is. We're not going to make it less than it is. And then we're going to put the problem in the perspective that you give. And we're going to recognize that whatever it is we're going through, it's going to end in praise. So Lord, I pray right now that you'll touch every life that's here, every heart that's reaching out to you. And Lord, I pray that into that life you will place your love and you will place your joy and you will pray, place your peace. And I pray that just as this psalm represents the final hallelujah, that that final hallelujah will flow from our lips and our lives will become that hallelujah. And we will mediate through who we are this amazing psalm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We just thank you that it all ends with praise. So easy for us to be overwhelmed. 
But Lord, you really are our place of refuge, our hiding place, our faithful God. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word that anchors us and holds us, that reveals that, Lord, uh, despite how we feel, this is not unprecedented (laughs) times, Lord God. We've been through hardships. Humanity's been through trials and come out. Those who have put their hope in you have ultimately not been put to shame because you are who you say you are. And you are a confidence that will not disappoint. God, we just bless you for who you are today. We thank you for who you are and who you continue to be. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. What an incredible word. What an encouragement. Isn't it great to have people that spend half their lives uh, dug into the First Testament, actually unpacking it and uh, kind of going, oh yeah, we missed most of that. That's great. That's helpful. That's really awesome. We won't all look at the Psalms just quite the same again. So thank you so much, Pastor A. And uh, those of us who have experienced uh, his primary form of worship behind the lighting desk have been blessed. Um, Ray just took on the task at at, um, great inconvenience to himself of lighting our um, North Island, uh, well, well, we'd probably have to call it Central now, which is Wellington Fearless Conference, and then as well um, in Auckland when we did our first Auckland one and just does an outstanding job and his hobby that happens to bless all of us uh, quite significantly. But we just appreciate just all that you do for Fearless too. And um, just absolute legend. I know that Jamie would be saying that, and if I didn't say it, he'd probably be messaging me because he's watching it at home right now. Jamie and Becca who've just poured themselves into Fearless. But just thank you for your partnership in that. But what an incredible word, what a rich word. May it dwell in our hearts richly. May it actually shape the way that we see and that we feel and that we think in the coming weeks. So, hey, why don't you stick around? We're going to finish up now, but stick around. There's only a couple of us here. It's a unique opportunity if you want to come. I'm sure um, Pastor Ray would love to meet you and um, bring all of your complex questions. He loves that. He has nothing else he would rather do than explain to you the meaning of life uh, from the perspective of the First Testament. God bless you. Uh, those of us, you online, just have a great day, and we look forward to being with you in person soon. God bless you.